Ladies and gentlemen, our third session will now begin. Please welcome Lee Gallagher, Rachel Brown, Majid Nawaz, and Vidya Ramalingam. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. And thank you for joining us for the last session of the Global Issues Forum hosted by the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. How about those past two sessions? I thought they were fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> we have a hard act to follow, but I, we're going to try to deliver. Um, and I know we can. So we're going to wrap up today with a very important discussion about how technology and civic engagement can help to disrupt ex extremist movements and the cycle of hate. So we're going to get really practical of tools and things that we can actually use to help uh, solve all the various problems we've been talking about today. We will have Q&A at the end, just like we did during the lunch. Uh, for our audience here in the room, please use the note cards provided to submit questions during the session. Just raise your hand, uh, and a staffer will come by to collect your cards. For our online audience, uh, submit your questions using the hashtag USHMM Forum and ask why. And now on to our truly incredible panel. We're very lucky to have these three with us today. Uh, to my right directly is Rachel Brown, who is a former fellow with the Holocaust Memorial Museum and the founder of Over Zero, which helps societies recognize and counter the impact of communication that leads to violence. She's also the former CEO of Sisi Niamani Kenya, which is an NGO that used text messaging to build peace and civic engagement during the 2013 elections there. Majid Nawaz is a former Islamic extremist and the founder of Quilliam, a London-based counter-extremist organization. And finally, Vidya Ramalingam is co-founder of Moonshot CVE, a London-based startup that develops data-driven technologies and counter-hate media campaigns to disrupt extremism and radicalization, both online and offline. So welcome, all of you. Um, I want to start by asking how you came to your work. Each of you came to your work for different reasons. Rachel, um, while you were a fellow at the museum, you began writing diffuse instances of past atrocities and looking at intergroup and identity-based violence. I had seen firsthand in my work in Kenya, and I had seen through studying and looking and working in different places, that there are patterns of speech over and over again. And the museum at the time had already done work on labeling and understanding this speech, calling it dangerous speech, often also referred to as hate speech or incitement. And we see it taking similar forms over and over again. Um, we heard about this in the two earlier panels. It's about creating an us and a them. It's about creating an other them that is often portrayed as inherently threatening, threatening our very existence. It's about creating a them that is dissociated from us, that is distinctly other and even not human. And it's just as much about creating an us that needs to be protected creating an us for which we should have empathy and take action, and creating the norms and pressures of what it means to be part of that us, either to take extreme or violent action, or simply to encourage it, to go along with it, support it, or stay silent. Um, and I had seen in my work the power of communication to lead towards violence, and also felt that we needed to do more, to be more strategic and more effective in how we addressed and countered that type of communication. I knew we weren't going to use fear, such a powerful emotion, for peace. So we had to find other more strategic tools. And so with Diffusing Hate, I really wanted to sort of audit and examine what we knew from fields like peace building, but also what we know about our brains and our psychology and history and even marketing to understand everything we could about how we're influenced by communication um, and how peace builders could use it more effectively for their aims. What are, as a language expert, a communication expert, what are the specific words or patterns of communication in the lead up to atrocity events? 
So there's been a lot of work um, by different people studying and looking at this. Um, and I think it's not so much about specific words. It's, it's also about um, the ideas and their delivery. Um, and so we can't just look at the content. It's not that the presence of a certain slur or negative word um, is the thing that holds so much danger. It's when these ideas become per pervasive, when they're held by those in authority and spread um, throughout society. Um, but, but there's a lot of things. I think it's, we see over and over again, the best justification for violence is self-defense. And so there's this necessity that the other has to become threatening. The action of violence has to go from being something um, that we consider in our society to be abominable, to not be okay, to something that's, that's not only justified but also very necessary. So there has to be, I think we see these dual creations of a very threatening them a very guilty them that's already maybe committed atrocities against us. Um, and the work of a political scientist, Jonathan Leader Maynard, really explores some of these dynamics. But we also see this powerful creation of an us. And we see a powerful shift in social norms, where in order to be part of our own in-group, we suddenly have to take action against that threatening them. And so you'll see often in atrocity events that some of the earliest groups to get targeted are not just the groups um, that violence is being mobilized against, but also moderate in-group members. Those members of the group that's being persuaded to violence who start to speak out against it are called naive and even traitorous. Uh, Majid, as a former extremist, you bring just a wholly unique, um, W-H-O-L-L-Y, unique perspective to all of this. So that informs your work to prevent people from joining such movements. So can you share with us your story uh, both joining and leaving an extremist movement. Yes, thank you. I uh, will give a very summarized version of that, but it, essentially it, um, in many of the uh, departure points and points of return, uh, I was pleasantly surprised to hear from the previous panel um, that there are uh, many similarities, and you'll find this as I, as I explain as well, between whether it's uh, white nationalism and far right extremism far left extremism and Islamist extremism and the departure points and the points of return from both because essentially we're all uh, very human and it's the same things that, uh, that trigger us and it's the same uh, empathy we require to pull ourselves back. But I, in, in a sense, essentially I was born in the United Kingdom um, and I came of age during the time of the Bosnia genocide uh, which is uh, apt for us being here I suppose and um, the genocide in Bosnia had a profound impact on the Muslim psyche across Europe. Uh, because up until that point, we weren't Muslims. Uh, I was otherwise known as a British Pakistani. And the Muslim identity hadn't come to the fore because I wasn't raised in any religious way. Um, but here we had in Bosnia, uh, white, blonde-haired, blue-eyed Muslims who were being targeted because they were historically a Muslim community uh, by everyone else's definition from other Muslim-majority countries. These guys weren't really Muslim enough. They were non-devout. Um, and relatively integrated into European culture, but still were uh, ostensibly identified for being Muslim and then targeted. And, and the way I try and explain it to Americans is um, it's a faster flight from London to Sarajevo than it is from New York or DC to LA. And so imagine a genocide unfolding on one side of this country and its impact, if especially it was against members of your own community, the impact it would have on you on this side of this, of this country. Um, it had a profound impact on us as European Muslims uh, across the entire continent, and things weren't ever really the same again. So I, at the age of around 15, facing what was a severe and violent domestic racism in Britain and witnessing the genocide in Bosnia unfold, began a process uh, of radicalization and uh, was recruited to uh, the first global Islamist group that popularized the notion that Muslims must resurrect a caliphate. Uh, as a solution to all of their woes, as a solution to this other that was targeting us. Um, and so at the age of 16, I joined Hizb tahrir which is a global Islamist organization that seeks to resurrect this caliphate. Uh, it's still legal across the West because it's, uh, it's, it's non-terrorist in its means. Um, it's called within our own lexicon, our parlance of those of us who work in this field, a non-violent extremist organization, which is why it remains legal. But yet its thoughts, its ideas, its beliefs what it advocates is all still very extreme and beyond the pale for most of us with a reasonable sense of uh, ethics. And so I joined this group at 16 and I left home and moved to, to London and I began recruiting for this organization. 
uh, uh, and that journey and my, the intensity with which I looked, took the seriousness of this cause um, led me to eventually arrive in Pakistan, where I co-founded the organization in Pakistan. Uh, the method of coming to power that we subscribed to was one of uh, military coup. And so we would deliberately seek to target army officers and incite military coups. And so we did that in Pakistan. We recruited army officers. And a number of coup attempts were, uh, uh, were actually attempted inside that country. And many of the former members of my group reside in prison because of those coup attempts in Pakistan. I, I personally was involved in recruiting some of those army officers from London who had come to London for scholarships. Um, I after, after my job was done in Pakistan, I ended up in Denmark, where I co-founded the Danish-Pakistani chapter of this group as well, um, and eventually um, went back to, to London because I was, all, meanwhile, trying to study for my degree. <laughs> I was studying in the University of London, uh, doing law and Arabic at SOAS. I, for the Arabic part of my degree, found myself in Egypt. I landed one day before the 9-11 attacks. Uh, and of course, the 9-11 attacks changed the security climate around the world. Uh, we found ourselves the subjects of an intense intelligence operation. And on the 1st of March in uh, uh, 2002, my house was raided in Alexandria in Egypt. And uh, I was uh, arrested at gunpoint, had my hands, tortured, uh, hands tied behind my back and taken to the torture dungeons of Egypt's state security headquarters in Cairo, uh, where there were hundreds of us and we were numbered. And that's where they began electrocuting everybody as a form of uh, interrogation. And eventually I was sentenced to five years in prison uh, in Egypt as a political prisoner under their emergency law and their suspended constitution. And we were uh, convicted for our ideas. Keep in mind, as I said, we uh, didn't subscribe to terrorist uh, means, but also in Egypt I hadn't even recruited any army officers. I hadn't even recruited any army officers in Egypt. And so I hadn't technically broken any law in that sense either. And yet we were convicted for membership of an extremist organization. And it was at that stage that Amnesty International took the decision to adopt us as prisoners of conscience. In other words, people that were detained merely because of our ideas, uh, even though Amnesty clearly disagreed with our ideas. What you see on the screen um, <laughs> uh, is the reason I got radicalized, my mother dressed me up like that. But, um, <laughs> That's a picture of me as a baby, but the, the, one, the other one there, that's my mugshot from uh, uh, Mazra'a Torah prison, uh, taken the day I was released from the torture dungeons and put into a, uh, into a political prison instead. And I spent four years from that shot onwards uh, inside the same prison that eventually held Hosni Mubarak when he was overthrown in the, uh, Arab, what's known as the Arab Spring, the Arab uprisings. Um, but it was amnesties reaching out to me uh, and adopted me as a prisoner of conscience that began the empathy process that you heard on the, from the previous panel. Because up until then, um, uh, this is me at 24 years old, by the way, um, I had never received a helping hand from anyone that I defined as the other. Um, uh, the only relationship I had with wider society was one of receiving violence from the police where I grew up and also from the racists who would, who would attack us with hammers, and of course, beyond that, seeing the violence and the genocide in Bosnia. So this was the first time that I received a helping hand from people that I'd come to define as my enemy, uh, and people that I despised and knew despised me because of what I stood for. And yet here they were campaigning for my right to believe in them as my enemy, and they were campaigning for my release on the, on the, on the sole premise uh, that I hadn't engaged in any violence. And that really touched me. So I spent the next four years from that photo onwards uh, studying, uh, at, and, and in exactly the same way again you heard uh, from the previous panelist, uh, studying my ideology with the desire to become an even better recruit for what I used to believe in. Uh, but the more I studied uh, traditional Islamic theology, the more I uh, studied the Arabic language and continued with those studies, the more I read English literature, uh, and the more my mind broadened, and uh, the more I became sympathetic to the letters that would reach me from the amnesty activists that were campaigning on my behalf. And so to cut a long story short, the, uh, the rehumanization process was essential before my ideas could change. I've said in my autobiography that where the heart leads, the mind can follow. And that's what happened in my case. When I was eventually released uh, uh, in April 2006, at the age of 28, when I returned to the United Kingdom, it took another 10 months because, of course, again, what you heard from the previous panel, um, to rip oneself away from what had become my entire identity. I was married into this organization uh, uh, my ex-wife with whom I have a child, um, both of whom are now estranged from me, 
Um, and uh, my entire friendship circle was entirely this, uh, this people that subscribe to this ideology. Mm. So it took that 10 months for me to pull myself out. But again, I didn't want to be silent after the damage that I believe I had done in spreading my ideology. I wanted to also take responsibility for what I had done, as opposed to just blame everybody else. It's very easy to do that. And of course, I had every reason to do that. Um, but I wanted to also take responsibility. So in 2008, I, uh, along with one other former Islamist, founded an organization that we called Quilliam, and it was the world's first counter-extremism organization. We've been working for 10 years now to push back against extremist narratives and to make sure that the current 16-year-old me doesn't join uh, an Islamist organization as I did at 16. Of course, you may want to say that with the rise of ISIS, we haven't really succeeded, but you know, we've got, we've got to try. That's what we're doing. Fascinating story, uh, Majid. Thank you for sharing, us, sharing it with us. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more later about your work with Quilliam and what exactly you do, the tactics that you use. Um, Vidya, can you explain to us how you came to work with far-right extremists in Scandinavia and Europe and what you learned through that experience? Sure. Um, so I'm, I'm American. I grew up down the road in New Jersey. Um, I moved to Scandinavia fresh out of college, um, was working with a few anti-racism organizations there, doing a lot of research and writing on the far right, trying to understand who they were, what they stood for, why they were there. I became increasingly frustrated when I was living in Sweden at the unwillingness of so many of the anti-racist activists that I was working with to actually engage with anyone in far right movements. There was so much galvanizing the great and the good, galvanizing people who already believed in the cause and who already were anti-racist, but very little willingness to cross that divide and, and talk to the other. So I wanted to break that, and I, I did something very simple. I just started reaching out to people. I started emailing people who were in the movement. Um, that was the first step, sending emails. Then I just started turning up at their rallies, at their events. Um, I, I couldn't exactly blend in, as you can tell. Um, so it wasn't, you know, as, as Matthew said, it wasn't undercover work. Um, but I just started talking to them. I started asking them questions. Um, soon, I went from going to rallies to being invited into their homes to meeting their, their families, their wives, their, their kids. Were they receptive to you when you would approach them at rallies? They, uh, mixed, re mixed responses. Mm -hmm. um, some people were, some people weren't. Um, surprisingly receptive, to be honest. And I think that there was a little bit of shock value there. The idea that somebody with my skin color, a woman, would be comfortable approaching a group of mostly men, um, some of whom had swastikas on their shoulders, and being willing to ask them a question, I think that was surprising for a lot of them. And I think that opened up a few doors. Um, the whole experience, it was, it was incredibly difficult. It, it, it wasn't easy. But for me, it was a, a kind of turning point in my understanding as to how we need to deal with this problem. I started to realize these people are not monsters. They are human beings. They have real stories that have led them into these movements. And they are capable of change. That has been what has underpinned most of my work in this field. Um, Following uh, an attack that took place in 2011, a man named Anders Bering Breivik um, carried out an attack in Norway, in Oslo, and on the island of Utøya. 77 people were killed. Following that moment, it, it was really a time where European governments started to take this problem seriously and realize that they needed to pay more attention to it. I set up and ran a program across Europe working with 10 European governments to try and raise awareness of what we can do to respond to right-wing terrorism. And I'm going to show you just one of, the, one of the videos that we produced because I think it does speak to this issue. Yeah, I think we have the video queued up, do we? Maybe not. OK. Maybe not. <laughs> oh, okay. oh, here we go. From early teens, I was uh, fairly disappointed on society and school and a lot of other different things. And when I got engaged with One Power Movement, it gave me a sense of not just being good enough, but being uh, superior. And that was really a key message that appealed to me. In this environment, you promote a lot of violence and hatred, and, and that makes you do stuff that you perhaps wouldn't have done otherwise. I think a lot of the people that, that were around me at that time really didn't know what to say or how to respond to, to this engagement. Uh, it's a very strict ideology and you have very strict rules on what's permitted and not. And to look at my comrades and think about this made me rethink 
is this really what I want to do with my life? I got in contact with Exit and found somebody who could understand and, and not judge my previous engagement and, and that really helped me in taking the, uh, the step to leave. So Robert is a, a friend of mine and a colleague of mine. He, he's someone who I hugely admire for his journey out of these movements, but not only for that, also for, for where he's come since then. So he's now the executive director of Exit Sweden, which is an organization that pulls people out of these movements. Um, this is a video that we created um, together following, following the attacks in Norway as part of a movement to, to help people understand across Europe what can be done to respond to the far right. But what's really important is that we engage people directly and that we talk to them as human beings and see them as human beings. I want to just pause for a moment because we're now going to go to our first survey question. We asked you, our audience, both in the room and online, if you believe that technology is uniting us or dividing us and here's what you said. We asked everyone before the forum. And the results are uniting us 29%, dividing us 71%. I think Mark Zuckerberg is going to have a lot to answer about that tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, let's talk about technology a little bit. Um, what role does technology play? We've talked a lot about being human, and we will talk more about that. Uh, but what role does technology play in recruiting individuals to extremist movements? and encouraging people to engage in violence, and how do you use technology to counter those efforts in your work? Rachel, you had direct experience with this in Kenya. Maybe you can talk about that. Yeah, and I guess I'll start almost with, with my answer to this survey question, which is both. I think um, communication plays a really important role uh, in leading societies, either towards or away from violence. And so when the communication around and the uh, the technology around communication changes um, and our capacity to communicate changes in fundamental ways, it creates new opportunities um, for division but also and violence, but also new opportunities for us to find connection uh, and for us to prevent violence. And I first experienced this um, in Kenya. So um, in Kenya in 2007 and 2008, um, the cell phone uh, was was newly widespread across the country. And Kenya wasn't a stranger to election-related violence, but following its 2007 um, election, there was widespread violence, and it led to um, over a 1,000 people being killed and hundreds of thousands displaced. Um, and when I moved to Kenya in 2010 and started to work with lo local peace activists, they identified these mobile phones as really powerful weapons that had been mobilized towards violence. They identified the use of text messaging in particular as something that helped uh, prepare groups of people for violence and also coordinate and plan violence and attacks. Because suddenly with the cell phone, you could spread information faster than ever before and across broader geographic distances. And so fear and rumors and misinformation were spread and seeded in the year leading up to the election. Um, and it was the types of narratives that we're talking about before, right? They're coming to get us. They're posing a threat to us. We have to act in self-defense to uh, prevent more blood of our people from being shed. Um, and while these uh, this, this new technology, this new tool had been used to promote violence, the local activists I worked with also saw an opportunity. And we worked together to say, how can we use that same speed, that same capacity for us to communicate across distance as a tool for prevention? Uh, and I want to, I think we have a video to queue up here so you can see a little bit of what we did, but also hear um, from some of these activists in their own, in their own words. Um, if we can queue up that video. Do the one, eh? Protests like these began when the results of the Kenyan general election were announced in December. Politically motivated ethnic violence has killed more than a thousand people. The contested election results led to an explosion of violence and killings, pitting ethnic groups supporting the president against those behind the opposition leader. The same bitter divisions were mirrored in many text messages. We can use our mobile phones to promote peace.
tumeweza kuweza kukusanya jamii kwa pamoja na kueneza mjukuu wa amani in a new technology to try out This is a moment for the people of Kenya to come together instead of tearing apart. They are saying that they are holding all our messages because they think they have an effect. There are some rumors that are spreading and people are becoming uh, anxious. We say we send the message. So this is just one example. Um, what we did, we knew that fear and the messages of fear would spread quickly. And so we got into communities and we got, collected people's numbers and we built a system where we could reach out. Um, to thousands of people very quickly in targeted locations to respond to fear misinformation. We also use that platform to drive in-person engagement with civic education, with political debates. Um, and I think this is just an example. New technologies, new forms of communication uh, provide opportunities for those who are seeking to promote violence to do so, but they also provide us with new opportunities um, to engage people. And you can see this going back to the Holocaust and Nazi propaganda. It made use of the most cutting edge technology of its time. And we will always see those efforts making use. We just have to be a step ahead and be finding those same opportunities and those new technologies and tools um, to unite rather than to divide. Majid, talk about the use of technology in your work. Yes, and I, I think it's crucial. I think that um, technology is part of life and we live integrated lives as human beings. And so any solution to a problem uh, will have to have technology as part of its overall uh, toolkit uh, but saying it in that way also makes us realize that technology is part of the overall toolkit. So the process of recruitment for extremists occurs using technology, uh, but crucially um, has to be complemented by offline components. And so likewise, uh, an attempt to challenge extremist recruitment and put forward counter narratives and alternative narratives must also therefore have an online or technological component, but also be complemented uh, by offline activity as well. So let me just show a video uh, because there's a, I have a radio show in the United Kingdom uh, that, uh, that I host and uh, I regularly interact with callers. Members of the public can call me up and uh, often extremists who are either current extremists who want to call me up to have a go at me uh, or former extremists call up and I, I sometimes get some really valuable insights uh, and confessions from them live on air. So we have a video that you can watch uh, from one of these and uh, it's quite surprising what this young, young man confesses to. Did somebody recruit you? Were you d doing your research online? How did this process begin with you? Um, both um, online, uh, I think, was predominantly the way that I learned things and justified things and whatever. I was in touch eventually with uh, ISIS soldiers through Twitter. Uh, I would communicate uh, with them uh, through that uh, method. Um, and then I had people uh, where I grew up in the city that I grew up in. Um, that um, thought like me as well, and we'd go and we'd visit scholars together, and we'd discuss uh, some of the things that were on our minds, and then we'd go away and we'd talk about how the scholars were not sincere enough. And I, I knew people who were, who were banned from all, they were Muslims, they were banned from all mosques in our city, for instance, because of things that they'd done. Now, there's some crucial elements here, insights for us, just to understand. First of all, by the way, that's, that's, a, that's a kind of conversation we have on national radio in the UK. We, we've got quite an intense problem with extremism across Europe. Um, and so this is, the, importantly, to air that conversation 
I think is a huge step forward in the right direction. We've not really been having that kind of national dialogue uh, for a long time. But there are some insights that we can glean from that very brief snippet of a longer conversation I had with him, uh, during which course of the time, by the way, he, he confessed on, on radio to having to have, have plotted an assassination attempt against me. Um, and he's since been de-radicalized. But uh, one of the things he said there, that he was uh, initially attracted to ISIS online, but then he went offline to meet with like-minded individuals. And it's that uh, complementary nature of the online, offline world that we must never forget uh, because we all live integrated lives, that's exactly how the extremists operate as well. The other thing, as, just as an anecdote, is that uh, he and his fellow uh, extremists were banned from all the mosques in his city because there was a civil society response offline to keep these people out of the mosques from recruiting other Muslims. But I wonder if there was an equal measure of response online. And that's a slightly rhetorical question because I don't think there was back in the years he was talking of, which is a couple of years ago, uh, there wasn't that equal measure of, just as all the mosques had banned him from coming in, there wasn't that pushback online to some of uh, the way in which ISIS was able to recruit, not just on Twitter, but other social media platforms as well. And I don't want to steal video thunder because you're going to speak to some of this. Uh, what I will say is that we at Quilliam uh, were engaged in some of this through Twitter. We organized something called, for example, a thunderclap at the peak of ISIS recruitment, uh, whereby we uh, initially, in a dark phase, uh, pretended that we were having these conversations with them in a neutral, neutral way to get their subscriptions without revealing that it was Quilliam behind this, and then began over a series of uh, pre-programmed tweets pushing out messages to these individuals that we were talking to uh, that would challenge some of their assumptions. We did that work in conjunction with the, the State Department here, and eventually towards the end of that series of thunderclap tweets, a thunderclap is when you have a whole mass tweeting program that puts out uh, tweets in a synchronized way to, to a mass audience in one go, in one clean sweep, mm -hmm. uh, and reaches a wider audience online. Uh, eventually, at the end of that program, it was revealed who we were. And of course, you're able to gauge all of the results and the feedback uh, from that work as well. So I think it's just important to keep it integrated in that way. Vidya, you're using data from online searches as part of your efforts. Can you quickly touch on that for us? Yeah, just to give a bit of background, I think there's a, a tendency these days to think of the internet as being a very scary place where the terrorists are winning, they're radicalizing, it's filled with hate. If there's one message I can get across today, it's that the internet is also a place of opportunity. It's a place where we can find people who are getting involved in hateful ideologies and offer them alternative information and try and change their minds. When individuals are getting involved in hate online, they oftentimes leave behind a trail of clues. It's essentially a kind of digital footprint that lets us know that they're getting involved in this sort of behavior. Um, some of the data we use is, is search data, and actually if we can flash up the, the next slide, should get a glimpse of, um, in the United States last year, the top far-right search terms, violent far-right search terms that were used across the country. Um, pretty shocking stuff, uh, large numbers of people searching for information about how to join the KKK, um, information about killing ethnic minorities, um, both African Americans and Jewish communities, amongst others. Um, you know, we, there's a lot of conversation these days about takedowns, about taking down content, which we absolutely need to do. But it's important for us to remember that behind people who are, you know, th there are people putting up content, but there are also people who are searching for it. You can take down the content, that doesn't make the people go away. It doesn't make the person that put the content up go away, it also doesn't make the person who, who is searching for the content go away. Um, what you're seeing here is, um, across the United States, the, the distribution of searches for hate material. Um, last year, it's, it's weighted by population, so you're looking at searches per capita. Um, this is the kind of information that we use to find people who are engaging with this sorts, of, this sorts of materials online and try and offer them alternatives. So it's really important just to remember these are human beings that sit behind each data point online and, behind, and, and in reaching those individuals, we can try and change them. Great. Uh, I'm going to take us to another survey question asked of all forum registrants, which was, do you believe that outside factors, i.e. media reports, social media posts, viral images, influence your views and even your actions? Yes, with 79%, no, 21%. Um, let's move on. I'm mindful of the clock here. Our time is just going, fading away. But um, tech or not, um, Explain how each of you and your respective organizations disrupt extre extremist movements 
through different approaches. I'm going to start, go back with you, Vidya, because you have something really interesting going on. Uh, Moonshot CVE partners with Google and YouTube and others in something you call the redirect method. Tell us a little bit about that, just briefly. Sure. So the redirect method is a methodology that we co-designed with Jigsaw, which is the in-house uh, technology incubator inside Google. We wanted to find a way to reach people who are searching for dangerous content on Google and who oftentimes get served directly with hateful extremist material that they're looking for. We wanted to give them an alternative. So here's how it works, if we can, if we can move on to the next slide. Um, and we move past the, the montage of, of Moonshot CVE. Um, the way it works is, is if somebody is um, entering in a, a hateful term on Google, we use the advertising space in a creative way to try and reach them with alternative content. We don't just try and reach them with one piece of alternative content. We gather a, a group of videos from across the world from content creators, whether it's the person standing there with their iPhone or an anti-racism organization that has created a video or a really effective um, interview on the news with somebody who was a victim. Them. We create those videos and we curate playlists. Those playlists, playlists are then offered to an individual when they are searching for hateful material. So as you can see, this is a search which actually is um, used across America at a shocking rate. Hitler is my hero. Um, if somebody searches for this without the redirect method, if we move on to the next slide, what they get served with is extremist content. Uh, actually, all four of these top search results are all content that idolize Hitler, um, were created by communities. With the redirect method, what they get is an alternative in a piece of information right at the top of the search results. The way that we phrase that ad is very much offering them content which looks like it might match what they were looking for, so we don't want to turn them off right away. We want to make them, make them think that they might get something from clicking on this. But then once they click on that link, if we go to the next slide, they get sent through to a, a video playlist. And what they get is a, a reel of video content that was created by individuals around the world. Right here we have um, a testimony of former extremists, um, a couple former extremists, former neo-Nazis speaking about their, their journey out. Um, we have some you know, much more mainstream content, um, such as videos produced by Starbucks around, um, around kind of controversies uh, about mosques and how communities have come together, um, and also testimonies from people who were denying the Holocaust and then traveled to Auschwitz. So, the whole, the whole idea behind the redirect method is can we use available tools for us, the same tools that Coca-Cola uses to sell us Coke, can we use those same tools to reach people at risk of, of hate and extremism and offer them alternatives? Great. Rachel, can you give us um, a little bit of insight into how your work with Diffusing Hate and Sisi Niamani, how that has informed your work with Over Zero, maybe one insight, just give us one insight that, you've, that, you're, that you're using in Over Zero? So I guess sticking with the theme of this panel, which is looking at technology and building on some of the conversation we've had here, ultimately this comes down to humans. This comes down to our human nature, to our um, tendency and proclivity to form groups and to see and experience and react to threat and, and pressures from our own group. And so I think one of the biggest takeaways from CC Niamani, which stayed through the guide and now informs a lot of our work um, with over zero is that what we fundamentally need to understand is human behavior. We fundamentally need to understand the people on the other side of the technology. And so when we're, we're, we now work with a lot of different organizations to help design strategies that can counter the impact of this type of speech and narrative and apply insights from all different fields um, in order to do so using an interdisciplinary approach. But when it comes to technology, the key is to really think about Start with the human and think about how are they getting information throughout the course of the day? What are maybe the online experiences that they're having and how is that translating into in-person interactions? What are the different mediums they're using? Is it their phone and Facebook and conversations um, in line um, while they're checking out at the grocery store? What are all those touch points that we can reach them through? And that's how we should be and can be identifying channels and working with groups to identify ways um, to reach people. We have to really start at understanding that human experience. Mm -hmm. Majid, you advocate for providing alternative routes uh, for individuals so that they may not feel that joining an extremist movement is the only way to have a voice in their community. So how does Quilliam reach those individuals? Yeah, that's a really important question because, uh, you know, I think the um, first people to notice somebody adopting extremist tendencies will be the primary caregiver, so the parents, or siblings of the person that's being recruited. 
Um, that's where they have their most, usually, um, their most loving and fulfilling relationships, but also where if something goes wrong, if that relationship becomes dysfunctional, can also be a trigger for that person seeking an identity and belonging mm. in the form of an extremist group or, uh, in some cases, criminal gangs as well. And so one of the projects that we are rather proud of, that we teamed up again with the State Department on, uh, was called Families Against Terrorism and Extremism. Because what we noticed, my own personal experience also informed this, is that my parents had always been against me uh, becoming an Islamist extremist, as I did at 16. Um, they were vehemently opposed to it, but didn't have the tools to be able to help get me out or keep me out. Um, my father was spent most of his life working abroad in Libya in the oil industry. But my mother especially um, really has always been a very uh, spiritual and liberal secular kind of Muslim, uh, more interested in Sufi poetry and Rumi's poems than she was in Islamist extremism. But because her generation, for her generation, religion wasn't the central pillar of their identity, but was actually one of their many identities, uh, she hadn't spent her time obsessing over argumentation and therefore wasn't prepared for the arguments that we had spent most of our time training on. And so she wouldn't have had the responses, even though she was born and raised Muslim and knew uh, or her family are Muslim and knew Islam all her life in a very moderate way, wasn't prepared to respond to some of the argumentation that we had, and therefore felt powerless. So one of the things we wanted to do was to actually say, well, if the families were the first to recognize when their loved one um, is, becoming, uh, is, is becoming an extremist, is being recruited, then we need to be able to train those families to make certain interventions at, at those early stages. And often it's the case that they notice something. And in many instances, it's been the father or the loved one, the sibling, the mother, who's reported their own family member. And of course, it's fallen through the cracks at later stages. But if we could train them to help that rehumanization process and that de-radicalization process, we could potentially save uh, that person going down the line and becoming a violent extremist. So we, we uh, uh, worked on this project to train those families and other frontline providers to A, notice what the signs of extremist recruitment are, but then B, also uh, develop certain uh, arguments and resources and people they could point them to so they could make those early interventions. We've got a small little video here just to kind of speak a bit about that. It's just a, a, a short one if we can play that as well. We do have a video about the FATE program. I think it might be scheduled a little later, but can we cue that up right now? There we go. Great. ISIS brings terror into our homes and into the lives of our children. The empty space at the dining table, the unslept bed, the unplayed games, the graduation, weddings, and birthdays, all erased. A family fallen prey to ISIS is a family changed forever. Our families have endured enough. There is a better way. With fate, families unite together against terrorism and extremism. We know that to make a difference, we must stand together. Fate connects activist groups, however small, into a network of like-minded families. We share with you, we campaign for you, we connect you. With fate, you are never alone. Great, very powerful. So, yes. <laughs> it's really, really powerful, really important work. Um, the last question I'll pose to all of you, and we're, we're almost out of time before we have to go to the Q&A, but how can individuals resist radical messages and groups and reduce their influence in society? By individuals, I mean everyone in this room. What tools are available to speak out and still protect our personal safety and the safety of others? What social structures are needed? Let's just go, Vidi, I'll start with you. Sure, um, so you know, I talked earlier about how the advertising space can be used to change people's minds. The question remains, can we actually mirror that human connection, that kind of empathy, personal relationship building in the online space? And this is what we're currently testing. So we're, we're currently setting up programs around the world that work to start conversations with individuals in the online space, send them private messages, offering an olive branch, a, a chance to have a conversation, saying, listen, I get where you are, let me know if you wanna talk. 
Those messages are sent sometimes by former extremists, sometimes by social workers, trained counselors, people who are trained up to deal with people who have vulnerabilities. And what we're testing is not only can we start these conversations online, but can we then bring these conversations offline? Can we take online relationships, which you know, t these days our relationships exist both online and, and offline. Let's face it, everyone's gonna go off after this meeting and be on WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger. So can we do the same to respond to extremism in the online space? And that's what we're currently testing um, and currently getting proof of concept on. Majid, what about you? Maybe a call to action to the audience. Yeah. Um, so I think, look, I, I'm used to being the, the Muslim minority in the room. I'm, I'm the Muslim minority on this panel. But I'm also very happy to be the You're only... also the male minority on this I panel. I suppose you just stole my thunder. Often, I'm so. also very happy to be the male minority <laughs> on this panel. And the reason I start with that is the following. You don't have to be a man to challenge sexism. You don't have to be a Muslim to challenge extremism. You don't have to be Jewish to challenge anti-Semitism. And you don't have to be gay to challenge homophobia. And so when t talking about challenging Islamist extremism or far-right extremism, you don't have to be from those communities to challenge that stuff because, of course, extremism is like a social contagion and it spreads, so it concerns all of us. And so all of us have a role. All of us can do something and take part. And I thought that, you know, I mean, our US director for Quidim Mohammed is here in the audience. Raise your hand, Mohammed. If you want to do something practical, speak to him. He'll, he'll, he'll organize it for you, because I want to actually, instead of just giving you a list of things to do, tell you an inspiring story at this stage. And that's one re very relevant to the Holocaust Memorial, and that is one of Otto and Elise Hampel. Otto and Elise Hampel lived under Nazi Germany. They were a working class German couple. They were not Jewish, to my knowledge. Forgive me if that's wrong. I, to my knowledge, they weren't Jewish, but they were definitely a working class German family who decided to use the technology of their day, which was drawing art on postcards and disseminating them across Berlin and leaving them in random places of the city as a way to resist Hitler. And so they decided that those cartoons, they would try and encourage people in an atmosphere to resist Hitler through challenging and mocking his rule. And imagine a husband and wife, a couple, facing German, the German regime in that way in the darkness of that tyranny and trying just alone to do that. And the reason I mention this example is because it's one that inspires hope and inspires all of us to know that we have a role, that we can do something. And the courage that that took, do you know, where, today is the 9th of April. Yesterday, on the 8th of April in 1943, Otto and, and Elise Hempel were executed by the Nazis for those postcards. And so, yet today we remember them a book has been written about them, a Hollywood film has been made about them. I think it's Hollywood anyway, but it's a film, Alone in Berlin, you can watch it. And it's that kind of inspiration that I think ordinary working class, am I right they weren't Jewish? No, not Jewish, yeah. Ordinary working class German folk who decided to resist Hitler. And so I think all of us have a role, all of us can think of creative ways like Otto and Elise Hempel did to resist tyranny and extremism. And even if we're not from that community, we have a social responsibility, uh, and, and that requires courage, but we can all, all do it as well. Rachel, I'll give the final word to you before we go to the to a few Q&A um, on the various roles people take in society. Um, I think we've talked a lot about extremism on this panel and throughout the day, and I think it's important to remember that genocide, mass atrocities happen not just because of a small group um, of people who have been moved all the way to the extreme. They happen because others support them. They happen because others create uh, an environment in which that type of behavior is approved, and also because so many people stay silent. And I think um, if we ask ourselves, what would I have done if I was alive during the Holocaust? Would I have, um, would I have committed acts that I look at and say are abominable? I think we also have to look at each of our capacity, um, not just to take the worst violent actions, but also to stay silent. And I think that's often where the biggest risk lays. And I think when we start to see um, these types of ideas and this type of speech creeping into our society, what we have to do is, is use um, the, the great privilege of learning from history, recognize it early and say that we do have a role to play um, and decide not to be silent. And I think that that silence is the biggest thing we need to guard against. And I think something everyone can do um, at whatever stage is just start to talk to the people around you. Um, we, we know that it is um, hardest to act alone. We heard about that this morning and we know this um, from studies um, and we know this from history. We know that uh, when people have resisted, when groups have resisted atrocities, it's be because they have done it together. And so 
um, the biggest thing and the call to action that I can say is to start talking about this. Right. Start engaging in your own self-awareness um, and start engaging in these conversations with people around you um, because figuring out collectively how you can take action um, is, I think, um, the, the most hopeful way forward. It's a very important point. So I'm going to just turn to two questions we have from our um, audience, uh, both from Facebook and uh, here in the room with us. So first comes from Facebook. Is the redirect method, Vidi, I'll target this to you, is the redirect method going to be used to silence ideas from people at risk to becoming extremists in a negative way or used to silence people from critical thought? So the, the objective of the redirect method is, is not to de-radicalize, it's not to have a definition of extremism and, and say you can't think that or search for that. The objective here is to offer alternative information. We all know that algorithms, um, and particularly Google, has been, has been the kind of butt of controversy around how their algorithms oftentimes surface really dangerous, awful content, even when you're not searching for it. Some of you might have, might have seen a few years back, there was controversy over um, when you search for Martin Luther King in the US, you're oftentimes given your first search result is a white supremacy website. It's a, it's a website that was set up as a mock website to offer alternative information about Martin Luther King, false information about him. Now imagine how many school children across America are searching for Martin Luther King for a school project and might stumble upon a white supremacy website. The objective of the redirect method is to offer alternatives and offer safe alternatives. And this is why we are not um, you know, going into the redirect method saying, what you're searching for is bad, you are wrong, here's, here's why you're wrong. What we are doing is simply saying there is an alternative. You are looking for this, Google's gonna give you loads of results that match what you were searching for, but here's one other option. And our other objective is we wanna keep you there as long as possible. Once you click on our material, we wanna keep offering you alternatives. Great. Um, here's a question from the audience that I'm gonna ask all of you to answer quickly in the time we have left. Um, how do we get moderates to raise their voice to counter the loud voices of extremists? I think this is a really critical question. Um, Rachel, why don't we start with you? Sure. Just really quickly. You know, um, I shot. think there's a few different things. And one is that I think we have to, I'll just give one example. Um, I think we need to provide alternatives that are outside of the political realm. I think that these, um, these issues can become very polarized. They can become very politically polarizing. And I think that it's important that we never allow the issue of whether a group should be painted as a threat, should be targeted with harm based on their identity, to become a partisan issue. I think that um, we need to step away um, from polarizing and, and um, demonizing and saying that one group sort of owns the narrative of speaking out against violence and against group targeted harm. We need to provide options where people can say that they're, for example, part of whichever political party, um, that they hold on to whichever grievances. In the work in Kenya, people had to still be able to say, I'm angry at my government, I'm angry that they're not providing, but I'm not okay with violence. Um, and so, and I think we see in this country, there's a large amount of political polarization. Um, we have to be able to step out of those particular political um, identities and say, you can hold on to your political identity, you can hold on in Kenya to your ethnic ethnic identity, whatever it is, but we're not going to let this type of action happen. And so I think it's a question of a new narrative and of role models um, that let people stand up and not feel like by speaking out they're joining one group or the other. Majid, why don't you take that as well? Yeah, I just think that the definition of being a moderate is that you don't want to tell people what you believe nor want to convince them that what you believe is better than what they believe. And so as a result, moderates, the majority, uh, suffers from a disadvantage, and that is that extremists are always the ones preaching. Of course, part of recruiting is preaching, and so they are the ones recruiting people, and they are the ones who are gaining in numbers, and they are the ones who are, as a result of that recruiting, organized in structures in society, and are therefore able to influence our decision-making processes and also go on that long march through the institutions. So you have a problem as a moderate that you're not doing all of that. So I think it's actually now the stakes are too high. We've seen the results of polarization. We're living it. Um, about uh, I think it was five, seven, eight years ago or something, I did a TED talk on the potential for technology to divide all of us and not just unite all of us. And back then it was heresy. Uh, it was on the TED stage. And everybody was in love with Google and Facebook. And everybody thought, thought it's like the, you know, it's just like the, a new version of inventing chocolate. Everyone loved it. Um, and, and I was there going against that grain and saying this stuff is, is also going to divide us. And uh, of course, it's happened now, and we've seen the consequences of it. And so the stakes are now too high for us, those who are moderates on, across the political spectrum. Mm. Of course, it's a non-partisan thing. It has to be. Um, because the stakes are so high now, I think we have to develop a way 
to assert ourselves without believing we are 100% correct. So how does that work, right? And I think the way it works is the following, is that if you experience 100% certainty from an extremist in the course, as we heard from the previous panel as well, um, but especially in the case of jihadists, to be able to kill yourself and many other people with you in a suicide bombing, you're gonna have to believe 100% you're going to heaven for that action. If you, even if you're only 99% convinced, you're not gonna risk it. Because of course, uh, the other end, that 1%, it could mean, you know, in your own doctrine, it could mean hellfire forever if you do something wrong. And so it's just about injecting a level of doubt. So how does a moderate inject a level of doubt and assert uh, themselves in a way without becoming an extremist themselves? And I find that the way to do that is to insist that though I don't have all the answers, one thing I do know for sure is nor do you. And it's, and it's actually more, more about saying, look, I'm not claiming I'm uh, uh, adhering to a political truth in my biases and opinions and political choices, which are by definition opinions, and therefore I'm not gonna force those on you. But what I am gonna insist on, that you also accept, uh, that yours is an opinion, not a fact. That yours isn't, also isn't 100% accurate and true. Um, and and that, I think that kind of uh, assertion of moderation we need more of, uh, because it's the absence of that that has given the extremists an advantage online and offline. And Vidya, your word on the role of moderates. I would only echo what's already been said. <laughs> <laughs> okay, nice and short, I love that. Well, um, I have four other really good questions. I'm gonna show them to the organizers and hope that we can find a way to answer them online or engage with people um, after this session. But in the meantime, uh, I've taken so much away from, from the words of our panelists, and I think we all have a role to play. I think that's one thing that's come through. Please join me in thanking them. And, <laughs> and I have an announcement. And if everyone could just stay in your seats, we're um, going to hear from Sarah Ogilvy in just a minute. If I could ask my panelists to stay in the seats as well, um, we're just going to hear a few words from Sarah Ogilvy. Thank you so much. Closing this session, can we take a moment to thank all our panelists and moderators today? So today we've taken time to step back from the rush of our daily lives and to consider what Holocaust history can teach us. What it can teach us about human nature, about what makes society strong or weak, and about the role individuals can play for good or for ill. If we learned anything, it's that we all have agency. No matter the circumstances, we almost always have more power than we realize. We hope you'll continue to talk about these questions, discuss with your family and friends, and online after you leave today. And you can post your questions and share your reflections using the hashtag AskWhy or hashtag USHMM Global Forum. For those still here in Washington, we hope you'll stay and con uh, continue the conversation in person, because we heard how important that is. Thank you all. <laughs>